and uh, welcome everybody to this 31st uh, Democracy Dialogues lecture. And I also welcome Dr. Parakala Prabhakar this evening. He is going to deliver a lecture on the political economy of New India. We know this New India was coined by the existing regime, <laughs> which they want to do away with all the past India after independence. So uh, Parakala Prabhakar, Dr. Prabhakala Prabhakar is very well-known political commentator. In Telugu land, he is quite famous, almost a household name through his various te television programs on political commentary and also introducing modern literature and all that. And he is a political economist and he did his uh, doctorate from London School of Economics and he's a author. His uh, recent book uh, on the current regime <laughs> is very well discussed and uh, he he's often uh, without any hesitation he exposes the shady policies of the current regime and also he meticulously analyzed the voodoo economic policies of the current regime which has brought disaster great disaster uh, even to the economy apart from the great uh, disaster that they brought to the political system uh, to India. This evening uh, Dr. Palkar Prabhakar is going to talk about the political economy of the new India. I invite Dr. Parkal Prabhakar, please, to take the, uh, make the presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Bhargava. Thank you, Ravi, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, my namaste to uh, uh, Swadesh ji and uh, Manishankar Ayer ji and uh, uh, Subhash ji, everybody. Um, I think... Um, uh, I'll speak for about uh, 40, 45 minutes, and then uh, we can have uh, some kind of a Q and A and some kind of a discussion. Because um, Bhargava, usually I'm not very uh, comfortable with the monkey bath type of uh, uh, talk, and I would like to have uh, some kind of a discussion and Q and A. So that is that is the format I'm very comfortable with. Um, Today, uh, I'll uh, <clears throat> make some uh, remarks as far as the uh, political economy of uh, New India is concerned. Um, I'll uh, give you some idea of uh, some of the economic aspects and then uh, uh, give my uh, observations on what is happening uh, uh, in the political field. And then also talk about the uh, uh, what is happening to the uh, social fabric of this country. Uh, this is how I would like to structure the talk. Uh, before I go further, I want to uh, uh, submit a one-sentence uh, proposition for your examination. And that is uh, the following. You know, the present government's economic philosophy seems to be to give five kilos of food grains each to the poor, free of cost, but give five airports to their friends. This, I feel, somehow captures the essence of this regime's attitude towards the political economy of India. They can manage the polity, get votes by giving five kilos of uh, free food grains each to the poor. And, you know, they are uh, trying to distort the economy. Uh, the, the policies are resulting in a distortion of economy by giving over uh, five airports to their uh, cronies. Now, these, uh, the, the economic uh, developments are really worrisome these days. I'll by looking at the, uh, the, the, the economic aspects, the unemployment is very, very severe in India. And recently, the International Labour Organization has come out with a report on the employment and unemployment in India. They said 
that of all the unemployed people in India, 83% are young people. And of all the young people, about 65% are educated young people, college graduates. And we have also seen recently the newspaper reports that uh, about 38% of the IIT graduates are waiting for their placements still. So that is the seriousness. And uh, if you look at the youth unemployment, youth unemployment is one of the highest in the world. It is about 24%. We are in the company of countries like Iran, countries like uh, Yemen, Armenia, and um, Lebanon. And they do not boast of being fifth largest economy or the fastest growing economy. We are boasting that we are fifth large, largest economy and we are the fastest growing economy. Even then, this is the kind of youth unemployment and unemployment in the country. I'm not going into the labor participation ratio and all that. That they are, they are not much uh, to be very happy about. Especially the women labor participation ratio is not growing. It is quite low. And um, once the once you have uh, low employment and especially youth and youth unemployment very high youth unemployment then of course the 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 uh, the wages are the the incomes are very low and the purchasing power is very low the demand is very low and therefore in the rural sector most of the mncs which are in the fmcg sector the fast moving consumer goods sector are reporting that the rural demand is very tepid and it is not rising this is the uh, uh, employment and income scenario. And then, uh, you know, these uh, figures I often feel that they, don't, they do not let you understand the gravity or, or the seriousness of the situation. Therefore, it is important, since we are talking about the political economy, we should also take a look at what is happening on the ground. Um, I do not know if some of, some of you have come across this uh, 2022 beginning advertisement by the railways. They have advertised for 35,000 jobs, the jobs that are termed as non-technical uh, um, uh, categories, NTPC jobs, non-technical uh, preferred categories, non-technical professional categories, whichever way you put it. And for 35,000 such jobs, they are non-technical, you know, there are different grades in it, including station masters and, you know, the menial jobs and manual jobs and things like that. For those 35,000 jobs, imagine there were 1 crore 25 lakh applications. That is the seriousness of the situation. The second example I would uh, place uh, before you is that the Israeli government has sacked all the Palestinians who are working with them for them in the Gaza area because there is a conflict going on there. And they wanted to get the manpower from their friendly countries. India happens to be one of them. So in India, they have opened recruitment centers in Haryana and Uttar Pradesh to start with and extended those uh, recruitment centers to Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan also. Now, when reporters went to the people there who were lined up after, outside the recruitment centers, large queues were formed outside the recruitment centers. And they've asked them, are you aware that you're going to go to Gaza? They said, yes. Are you aware that there is a conflict and the war going on there? They said, yes. Are you aware that uh, bombs are raining there? They said, yes. Are you aware that, you know, people are dying like flies there because of uh, bullets and war and destruction and uh, bombings and other things? They said, yes. But then, do you, you know all these things and you still want to go and work in Gaza? Then they said, yes. And they said, 
instead of dying here without jobs, we go there, take a chance, and as long as we are alive, we can earn something, feed ourselves, and send some money home back. This is the second. And uh, the third one I would like to uh, place in front of you is that, uh, you know, a, a month or so ago in Hyderabad, we all woke up to uh, a very horrible news in our newspapers. And I do not know, in, in other parts of the country also, some people tell me that uh, it was carried in a, in a small way, was that, you know, a dead body came back from Ukraine to Hyderabad. A young man's dead body came back. And then we realized that a lot of young people were being recruited, probably are still being recruited from India to go and aid the Russian war, war effort in Ukraine. So, which means that Indian young people are prepared to go to Ukraine, they are prepared to go to Gaza, 35,000 for 35,000 jobs, one crore, 25 lakh people are jostling for. Uh, 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 you know, uh, writing an exam, entrance examination, you know, for those small number of positions. And in places like IITs, 38% of graduates are still waiting for placements. This is the uh, scenario today. The reason why I gave you this is to, to, to bring your attention to the human condition, not just, you know, it says 24%, 38%, or 63%. It's not that. But you see, when, when I spoke about the 24% youth unemployment, I spoke about the headline uh, inflation. Um, and say, sorry, headline unemployment. But if you disaggregate the data, of that 24%, if you see, if you look at 20 people between the ages of 20 and 25, the unemployment rate among them is 40%. This is as far as the uh, unemployment uh, situation is concerned, especially among the youth unemployment is concerned. And of course, uh, the, the, the unemployment among the women is concerned because the, the, the labor participation ratio anyway is quite low. The second one I would like to uh, present here is, uh, um, you know, uh, According to the National Crime Records Bureau, NCRP, the highest number of suicides are among young people, self-employed, that is small businesses, and then uh, farmers. So these three sections are being crushed in today's New India. And because employment, unemployment situation is so grim, the the incomes are, are quite low and therefore the savings are quite low and therefore the liabilities are quite high. And the recent data tells us that household savings is at a historical low of 5% today. And household liabilities, that is debt, is at a historical high at 40%. This is as far as the uh, debt and incomes are concerned and savings are concerned. And then a huge number of high net worth individuals and who are capable of investing in this country are relinquishing India's citizenship and going away from this country. Not not. Uh, leaving the country and relinquishing the Indian passports, Indian citizenships. And the figures for that is on an average for the last 10 years is about 1.5 lakh people. And 2022 for which the figures are available is about 2,25,000 people have relinquished the passport and went away. They're going to different places. They, of course, they're going to uh, some some uh, people are going to the Middle East. Some people are going to Singapore. Some people are going to uh, different shows, maybe America, maybe Europe and other places. So there is a, there's a huge uh, amount of uh, number of people who are going away who could have otherwise invested. And of course, domestic investment is also falling progressively. And today, uh, 10, 12 years ago, where, while it was about 30%, today it has come down to 
This is in spite of the government doing a lot of things or you know trying to do a lot of things in order to retain or in order to increase the domestic investment the the government has uh, brought down the corporate tax rate to 22% from 30% they have introduced what is called the production linked incentives pli scheme they've also uh, written off a lot of corporate debt and uh, there, there, there have been uh, repeated appeals by the government and other government ministers and ruling party people and uh, secretaries and uh, people from the from the government um, in in different conclaves of the investors and uh, industrialists asking them to invest. And notwithstanding whatever the investors and industrialists and captains of industry say in such meetings. Actually, the, the proof of the pudding is that they are not really investing. And you see, if the if the investment climate, if the economy is doing well, you really cannot stop an investor from investing. If, if an investor sees a prospect of profit, nobody can really stop those investors. But in spite of so many in entreaties and uh, incentives, they are not willing to come forward and invest. So therefore, the domestic investment is falling it is it is foreign not only that the the fdi the foreign direct investment is also falling it is it is it is uh, um, uh, it is contracting on the one hand it is contracting on the other hand you know the domestic investment which is already there is slowly being withdrawn there are there are figures and there are uh, uh, studies done uh, from from the RBS data back, uh, this is one more thing. So th 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 there's some problem with uh, both domestic investors as well as the investors from overseas. This is one. The other thing is that uh, um, the the prices are rising, and they are rising uncontrollably. Um, the headline inflation uh, rate that the RBI talks about, I mean, they, they said uh, it, it cannot be more than 6%. It has to be brought down to 6%. And uh, the headline inflation, which actually doesn't mean much because the, the, the basket of uh, uh, goods and uh, uh, services and commodities consists of so many things which are not directly relevant to many common people like you and me. Um, uh, because they, they they contain commodities, metals, and all that, you take that uh, away. Uh, but if you look at the food inflation, it is somewhere around the food inflation today in India is somewhere around twenty two to twenty three percent. Health inflation, education inflation, these are the things which which really impact the the people. So they are very high. Um, if you, if you look at the pulses inflation, uh, milk inflation, and you know the uh, vegetable inflation, etc., so they are, they are quite high. You know, I do not want to bore you with all the data and figures and all that. But you know, the the, the thing to understand is that anything to do with the common person, anything to do with people like you and me, are now going up. And I'm not trying to, you know, sometime back, the, the government has uh, come out with a white paper on the economy. That was uh, sometime in, in uh, February. And uh, somebody asked me what I thought about the uh, uh, white paper. Then I told them that, look, I, I, I did not have to wait until the government releases the white paper on the economy. But um, I, I had some kind of an idea. And I told them, look, I, get, I go and buy my own vegetables every week, once a week. I buy my provisions myself. I go to the shop and buy it from uh, the local Kirana shop and the provision store myself uh, every month. So every week when I go to the vegetable shop and vegetable market, I get a white paper. And every month when I go to my provision store, I get another white paper. So I get uh, uh, four white papers from uh, in a month from the uh, uh, vegetable market and one uh, white paper from the um, provision store. So I get five white papers every month. When I look at that, I, mean, I, I won't give you a, a range of uh, uh, goods and things, vegetables that I that I buy and uh, uh, to compare. It, just one, you know, uh, tur dal, which is, which is very commonly used in our parts of the country. Um, 
it was not long ago. I'm not, I'm not comparing the prices under Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, you know the present government. I'm I'm, co I'm comparing the the prices. You know, last year, 2023, December, November, and today, you know, I paid uh, uh, I, I paid uh, 110 rupees for batur dal a kilo in November. And today, I pay about 200 rupees. And if you go to a, 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 a good branded supermarket like Ratnadeep and other things, you know, you might get, you will get it, I think, about for about 223 rupees. Okay. But I go to a normal shop and it's about 200, 200 rupees or so. So that is the kind of price rise people are uh, uh, witnessing today. So there's huge price rise. There is... Uh, 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 low domestic savings, very high domestic uh, uh, liability, um, huge youth unemployment, uh, big rural distress, and um, uh, the the investment, private investment is falling in spite of uh, you know government uh, initiatives and PLI and crowding in of investment, etc. etc. But there are many technical things that 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 talk about, but. Nothing is really working as far as the domestic investment is concerned. Um, that is mainly because you know the, the market is not really uh, appearing uh, to be uh, uh, you know conducive for them. Otherwise, uh, why would uh, anybody not uh, invest? That is one. the The rural economy is uh, is 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 in, a, is in a distress. The rural markets are tepid. The rural demand is tepid, and the real wages in uh, um, in, a, in a lot of sectors are not rising and when they rose I think they rose in in a couple of sectors like construction etc the the, the 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 lower wages when they rose they rose by 0 0.2 percent you can you, you can hardly call it a rise actually and th th this is uh, this is the uh, as far as the economy is concerned, there are there are many things. Of course, we can talk about when we have some uh, Q and A. But I would uh, limit the economy thing to uh, these four or five aspects. And um, let me now come to the 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 democracy aspect of it. Um, there are there are many issues that we can talk about. Uh, the center state relations and the bills are not uh, uh, the governor is not signing the. Uh, approval to you know, the consent to the bills and some of some of them are going up to the president and they again are get their they're stuck especially the fiscal relations between the center and states are in a in a bad shape and the um, the the consolidated fund and you know they they go around the consolidated fund and there is a lot of collection of uh, cesses and surcharges and consolidated fund is in the divisible pool in the divisible pool you know you anyway have to give it but then outside the divisible pool you have the cesses and uh, uh, surcharges and they are not being properly shared and you know there's there's a lot of uh, um, transfer of in, in transfer of uh, fund from the center to the states. There's a lot of favoritism. There's a slogan of uh, you know double engine of car and things like that. You know th that that apart. You know uh, if you look at uh, the the actual political democracy uh, issues are concerned. Now we have uh, uh, we have passed uh, uh, some time ago three legislations concerning the farm sector. Now I'm not going into the de into the merits or demerits of the farm legislations. I mean, some people say they're good, some people say they're bad. That that's a different debate altogether. But the limited point I'm trying to make, which is very important, is this: you know, agriculture, farming sector is a very very important sector in our economy even today. Directly or indirectly, it uh, it it, it uh, employs largest number of people, largest workforce is absorbed there. And uh, even if you take the political geography of India, a large amount of uh, geography of India is um, uh, dominated by agriculture. About such sector, this government decides to bring in three laws, three legislations, and there is not even a three minutes of discussion on these three farm legislations and their past. And there was uh, a huge protest. 
Now again, the protests are resumed, but this is a different phase. But the first phase of protest, there was very, very huge protests and uh, uh, the government uh, used force to attack them. And, you know, there were uh, uh, um, roads were dug and uh, barbed wire was, uh, uh, the Delhi was uh, uh, fenced off and they wanted to come and give a memorandum to the government. The government was no more to receive a memorandum also. They prevented them. There were uh, uh, tear gas shells, the rubber bullets, and you know more than 700 farmers died in firing and all that kind of thing. On top of that, on top of that, the farmers who were agitating were called all sorts of names. They were called Tukte Tukte Gang. They were called anti-India. They were called, uh, of course, uh, anti-government. They were called uh, Khalistanis. And they were called all sorts of names. But then, uh, at that point of time, when the Punjab elections were just about a week or so uh, um, to be held in a week or so ago, the Prime Minister has decided to withdraw those uh, farm laws made an announcement to, that he would uh, withdraw them. And when the parliament met, those three laws were withdrawn again without even three minutes of discussion. You know, when you legislate, you don't allow any discussion. You don't tell the country why you are legislating in a particular way. There could be good or bad. You know, you, 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 are, you are, we are supposed to be in a democracy. You are supposed to listen to and convince the other people who are objecting to it or who have misgivings on it. Uh, or you listen to them or you convince them or you get convinced. You know, some kind of a dialogue, some kind of a discussion, uh, some kind of a give and take and uh, uh, some kind of a dissent. You know, all these things, they are just given a go by. And when you decided to withdraw them, again, there was no discussion. And today, the, the, the issue is that, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, um, undertaking that the government had given while withdrawing, those undertakings are not fulfilled. So again, there is an agitation. That's a different uh, chapter altogether. But the point I'm making is that, you know, when such important, significant laws were made by India's parliament, there's hardly any discussion. The government is not prepared to listen. The government is not prepared to do any discussion. And if the government wants the people in the country to believe that democracy is nothing but shutting up and then going once in five years to a polling station and voting and coming back and then again not speaking at all. But, you know, it's very difficult to accept that kind of a definition or, of, of democracy and, you know, swallow this kind of a thing. So, so that 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 is another one. Of course, there are instances where about 143 members of parliament were suspended and legislations were uh, you know uh, uh, passed. And uh, you know you you have uh, uh, the new parliament building with the president. Uh, where 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 the constitution defines parliament as Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, and the president of India, but the president of India is nowhere to be seen. Um, uh, the president had uh, no place in in those things. So all the uh, uh, violations of uh, uh, federal principles and uh, the way the NIA functions, it can just go and intervene in, in any state the way they want, uh, the laws that are made, the parliament functioning and the kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, breaking of uh, the parties and uh, changing the governments, the taking over of governments and all these things are, look, look at uh, how the, 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 the politics is is being run by in in in, in the the present regime in, the, in 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 new india then you know um, the 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 social fabric the interfaith relations the social relations in india today are at a i mean they're, they're so frayed because you have uh, so many lynchings so many lynchings. And you have uh, ruling party leaders, legislators, and even uh, central legislators openly welcoming and garlanding people who are released, um, uh, who condoned and released. Uh, when you when you kick off the uh, Azadi Kamrut Mahotsav, um, the 75th anniversary of uh, India's independence, um, people who are not just accused, but they were, were convicted of um, uh, killing and raping. 
and there was there are uh, uh, any number of uh, 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 dog whistles and dharma sans uh, and uh, calls for economic boycott calls for uh, uh, genocide uh, call for mass killings yeah um, and then uh, um, uh, there are there are instances where in places some places in uttarakhand houses were marked so that it will be easier when you would really have to get down to attack you know the 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 places are marked they've gone to that extent and then economic boycott in the sense of you know there are open calls in public meetings there are open calls by leaders of a, a, a particular uh, stream of uh, political thought in our country where they they call for you don't buy the buy anything from their shops and you you don't uh, sell anything to them that kind of an economic boycott calls this is one the the other thing is that you know the the ruling party which claims to be uh, not only the biggest political party in india but probably the biggest political party in the in the world um, maybe even the galaxy we do not know um, they they today they, there is not a single person belonging to the biggest minority of india the muslim in its cabinet and in its council of ministers not only in cabinet council of ministers but they do not have a single member from the biggest minority in their uh, uh, lok sabha parliamentary party and the rajya sabha parliamentary party and the biggest state in india uttar pradesh they do not have a single mla belonging to the biggest minority in gujarat this the same case for the last so many years even in karnataka where they were recently defeated even there also they did not have a single person belonging to the biggest minority in our country so the the ruling party the government the government structure the governance structure that they have erected does not really does not look like a microcosm of india and in in up if you look at it closely and also in in gujarat not only that they do not have a single legislator belonging to the the largest minority not a single person from that community is given ticket it's not that you know they we gave tickets and they they lost and you know we, we, we can't we can't help it or nothing could be helped it's not that not a single person was even given the ticket that that is the state state of affairs that means the the othering is 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 full blown now it is no more with them you know it is no more without them and all that it is no more it is it's already it's already without them and in spite of them i mean that used to be the 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 formulation of uh, um, uh, lk adwani with them without them and in spite of them so now it is without them and in spite of them not not with them at all you know the the the, the point is that you know it is now the 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 objective of the ruling party today that you can completely you you can completely ignore a section a large significant section of our population and still come to power both in the state as well as in the center this this is the message that is clearly uh, uh, sent by the ruling party so that is the kind of social fabric that we we we, uh, we are now we witness now today in new india uh, the the economy is in is in a deep crisis in spite of what the government says about uh, you know uh, fastest growing economy the fifth largest economy i'll just add uh, a couple of remarks about the fastest growing economy and the fifth largest economy uh, and then and then then we can get into the discussion you know if it is uh, if it is uh, a fifth largest economy overtaking the united kingdom's economy then the the question arises uh the united kingdom's economy is a developed country's economy isn't it it's a developed economy now if we overtake united kingdom which is a developed country that necessarily should mean that we have already become a developed country but then the prime minister on the other hand says that you know he will make india a developed country in 2047 so there is a there is a very clear apparent contradiction 
and, and, and what they say that is that is the state of affairs today and what they're promising. That is one. And if it is a fastest growing economy, then why is it that the government finds it necessary to give free ration to 81 or 82 crore people in the country? So how do we square these things? This, this, is the, this is the question, which brings me to the, the initial remark that I made, that you, know, you, 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 you make 82 crore people dependent on your five kilos of ration so that they shut up and they, they feel that you know, government is doing something for us. And then you know, siphon off the resources in so many different ways by, by you know, uh, privatizing. By it's not just disinvestment, it's, just, it's purely privatization, giving it off to their cronies. This is the, the larger picture. The new India, both econom, both in terms of economy as well as in polity and you know the society and other things, is in a very, very precarious situation. The Republic is in a crisis. The Republic is now in such deep crisis that if it is not rescued, Especially there is now, uh, because there is an election now which is going on, which is going to conclude soon. If in this election, if this republic and the republic's values are not rescued, values of diversity, secularism, pluralism, and more importantly, democracy. If these are not rescued now, then I, my apprehension is... I may be overstating my case. Some friends tell me that you know I'm even I'm even uh, uh, being an alarmist. But I I, I think uh, my my fears and my opinions are well founded. That if at this juncture our republic is not rescued, we probably will not have elections again after 2024. These elections. We might have elections like you know Russia's uh, Putin's Russia has elections or in North Korea there is there is election China there are elections they might we might have some kind of a, an exercise some kind of a uh, you know uh, a ritual of an election but no elections and every state in this country might burn like Manipur somehow Manipur. Maybe it is not a very important part of our political imagination. We just don't feel, you know, what is happening in Manipur is is, is anything to do with us uh, in 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 the so-called mainland India. But the the it, it, what is happening there can be replicated everywhere. It can happen in any state, and probably it will happen in every state if this is not rolled back. So the, the new India is now has now reached a very, very uh, crucial juncture and, a, and a, it has reached a crisis point. The, it, it has to be rescued. That is my submission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Prabhakar. For this lucid uh, presentation and a very clear and presentation about the dismal picture about Indian economy and all political and social tragedies that are <clears throat> along with it, it's emanating from that. And uh, I request uh, Manik Shankar Sahib to make his initial comments because he is also as a time constraint, I request Manishankar Ayasab to make his comments first. Please unmute yourself, sir. Manishab. Yeah. You, are, you are muted, sir. Sir, Manishankar ji, uh, you are muted, sir. You, you, you need to unmute, sir. You need to unmute your... Listen, Bhargo, you know, all the audience is muted. Uh, ask uh, Yatendra to unmute him. Yeah, yeah I, I have given them. 
the right to unmute themselves. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, as usual, uh, Dr. Prabhakar's presentation has been revelatory, has been deeply convincing, and it's also been very alarming. Um, effectively, he has said that this is the last, at least partially democratic election that we are ever going to have, unless the government is overturned on the 4th of June. And what I, the only question I have to ask Dr. Prabhakar is, as far as people like me are concerned, what you've stated is a number of disturbing facts and figures. But these facts and figures are the lived reality for the vast majority of Indians. Is it enough to make them turn on their tormentor? That's my question. And um, that's a very, un, a very difficult question also to answer. And, um, you know, uh, Manishankarji, I feel that uh, uh, it, it's now, the, 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 the narrative is now turning against the government. Uh, I've been uh, going around the country, you know, for the last eight to nine months. You know, about three months ago, I I, I thought that uh, if, if, if if everything, I mean, the, the the basic assumption is that the elections are going to be fair. But therefore, I I tell you what I gathered from the the ground. The ground reality is that if, if the ground reality is faithfully reflected in the machines, the voting machines. My forecast about three months ago was that the BJP is was unlikely to cross. 220 to 230 seats on their own. And their allies might pick up another 30 or 40. And now, after, after the uh, electoral bond scam and, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, things that the, the Prime Minister has been saying uh, in his election rallies, my current forecast is that the BJP is unlikely to cross 220. They, they might score about somewhere between 200 and 220. This is my uh, uh, forecast. And the other thing is, what about the allies? Allies, as I said, they, they might they might uh, bring in about 30 or 40. But but here is something interesting because not a single ally this time from the NDA is an ideological ally, unlike before, unlike, you know, Akali Dal or uh, uh, Shiv Shena and other, other places. All of them are very contextual allies, real politic allies. So if the BJP is not strong enough to form government on its own or within the striking distance, then the existing allies, some of them might even slip away from them. And, you know, the, the kind of number that you have today in India, I think they have about, uh, Manishankarji is about 27, 29 or something like that. But but if you, if you notice, seven of them are from your state, Tamil Nadu. And not a single one. I mean, most of them, I think about out of seven, six of them or five of them cannot pick up even a single seat. They may be, may be even not contesting also. You know, therefore, the, the, the number of the allies, the number of allies is inflated, but actually they are not very strong. They are not going to give them, except, you know, uh, if, if everything goes fine, uh, maybe from Andhra Pradesh, uh, Telugu Desh can bring in uh, some substantial number. And uh, maybe uh, Patnaik, if he chooses to go with them, they are not a part of the alliance, but if he chooses to go with them, they can also bring in some kind of a substantial number. Otherwise, nobody is, 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 is likely to bring in any substantial number. This is one. The, the second thing is, you know, what what uh, what gives me this kind of uh, confidence to uh, 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 go for a, 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 a forecast like this is um, because I have uh, I have uh, historical data with me, and you know, at its peak, the BJP 
1998, there was it's their peak electorally performance, not in number of seats, but percentage. That was about 25%. And 2014 was 31%. But thirty one percent, you have to you have to apply uh, corrections and, and and adjustments to that thirty one percent because allies votes also will be counted because for instance if you if you take my home state uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, if if they were allied allied with uh, Telugu Desam Party and BJP does not have much vote bank there and uh, if in a constituency where BJP contested they polled three lakh votes it's 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 it's, it's unlikely to be more than ten thousand votes are their votes. So the rest of the votes were brought in by the ally Telugu Desam or somebody else. So if you if you make those adjustments, the thirty one percent would have would would have would have been actually speaking on their own. They 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 they, they would have polled about twenty six or twenty seven percent. So which means that in 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 two thousand fourteen compared to to nineteen ninety eight, their their vote share increase was about two to three percent, not more than that. All the fanfare with of Narendra Modi has brought them only about two or three percent, or maximum four percent, and then. In the wake of Pulwama and uh, Balakot, their uh, vote share went up to 37% uh, in 2019. Again, if you apply this kind of a correction, it, you have to take out about 5 to 6%. So that could be about 31%. So between 1998 and 20, 1998, 25% and uh, uh, 2019, uh, say about uh, 31%. So the, 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 the accrual, net accrual, could not have been more than 6%. And this 6% today is in two minds. Most of them is again retreating. You know, uh, in, 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 in 2014, the additional vote that has gone to the BJP in the wake of uh, India Against Corruption movement and, you know, uh, those kind of uh, scams and the general impression that the UPA2 was very corrupt and all that kind of a thing, um, a lot of middle class, educated people, uh, you know, inspired by a lot of NRIs and uh, uh, <laughs> professionals. All these people have gravitated towards uh, BJP and they all thought, you know, Gujarat model, this is a very efficient, uh, going to be an efficient prime minister and all that kind of a thing. And uh, the 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 electoral pitch also in 2014 was not Hindu-Muslim pitch. It was uh, it was uh, you know creation of jobs, two crore jobs per annum, bringing black back black money, um, uh, doubling of farmers' incomes, and you know um, no corruption, clean government, and all sorts of policy, no policy paralysis. And this was the this was the pitch. So with that pitch and with India against corruption movement and you know um, a, a contrasting of personalities between uh, a flamboyant Narendra Modi branded very well and uh, social media offensive and all blitzkrieg kind of a thing and then a very normal kind of a Manmohan Singh you know all these have brought them about three to four percent and because of Balakot maybe another three or four percent you know. Today, because of the economic distress, because of uh, unemployment, because of, uh, you know, and on top of it, you know, I, I remember very well those days in 19, uh, even in 19, when, when we talked about, you know, what, what, what has he delivered, no jobs, etc. You know, they, they used to, say, many people used to say, yeah, they've not delivered all right, but then at least they're not corrupt. They're clean. But today, even that facade has gone because of electoral bonds people now know that these people are corrupt. And, you know, that moral high ground of na khaunga, na khane dunga is completely shattered now. And not only in the people's perception, but even the BJP, BJP top leadership also is unable to defend. The best defense that they are able to put up now is that they also took the money. It's not just us who have taken the who have taken the uh, electoral bonds. They have also taken. So you know that you are a party with the difference. You are uh, you are you are uh, your moral high ground of na khaunga na khane dunga is completely gone. So when you 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 as corrupt as uh, as anybody else, and you, or you are corrupt and you are not clean anymore, and with this kind of a rural distress, this kind of an unemployment, this kind of a price rise, you know all the accrual and. Uh, you know, uh, 
another thing uh, uh, manishankar ji i do not know i mean you 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 probably uh, would have observed it much more is that this this something called a moody fatigue has set in you know everywhere moody everything is moody and and i've seen so many middle class people changing channels or switching off when the prime minister comes onto the stage because it's, it's 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 he everywhere you 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 switch on your mobile phone is there and the newspaper is there and petrol station there's a hoarding is there and you know airports is there highway hoardings is there everywhere is there television is there newspapers is there everywhere so there's the and you know you, you can launch a brand like that but if the brand doesn't walk the talk you know all that comes down and there'll there'll be backlash and i think i think today in india the modi brand is experiencing a, a very very strong backlash because there is no performance on the ground so in, in the in, in this background i i i think we are going to see a huge change if everything is good but the point is that you know this regime has too much at stake to vacate the seat of power you know once they vacate the seat of power you know so many scams and so many scandals starting from rafael to pegasus to pm cares to electoral bonds to you know the the the, the difference of about 60000 crores people have calculated between the declared income of uh, bjp and what they've spent on their uh, party offices and you know so election, election funding election campaign and all that you know all these things and many more probably will if they come out they will suffer a huge setback almost akin to what they have uh, suffered after the assassination of mahatma gandhi it could be that severe a setback that severe uh, you know uh, a blow to them and next year 2025 is going to be the centenary year of the rashtriya swayamsevak sang they would like to have their own friendly government they would like to have their swayamsevaks as the as the prime minister home minister and all that kind of a thing so you know given all this they would they would not very easily vacate the seats of power is my apprehension so they would like to hang on to it it all now depends on uh, you know how uh political parties resist and uh, civil society resists and how they the call they it's all called out because you see now now the electoral process is under suspicion uh electoral election commission is now almost like a government department because the, the appointment itself in the process of appointment the role of the supreme court is completely eliminated it is now completely appointed by the government because the committee has government uh, majority 2 is to 1 and uh, the leader of the opposition had no role in it actually so and uh, the 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 conduct of the election commission also gives strength to these, to these kind of uh, uh, you know apprehensions and suspicions so this is the kind of situation that we are in today thank you very much i think that clearly sets out the parameters and in a single sentence i would say that if the elections are fair and reflect the voting pattern then modi is out if however the election commission and others concerned conspire with the government to uh, fiddle the election results then one doesn't know what the outcome will be on paper on the 4th of june or the, but we do know that in reality new india is not being accepted by new indians thank you very much yeah yeah uh, i will ask ravi our comrade to say a few words ravi thank you subhash and uh, i lost part of mani sahab's question and prabhakar sahab's answer because uh, in this part of the world's fifth largest economy we have often power cuts you know so i you know it, there was power cut at my place anyway thank you so much again prabhakar sahab for accepting our invitation uh, it has been such a wonderful opportunity to have you here and you gave such a lucid talk um in at this platform uh, we have kind of um, focused 
usually more on the social as well as the political arena, how the social arena in India as it is has also helped these majoritarian fascistic forces through democratic processes to come to power. And that is not unusual. I mean, many you know more famous examples of fascists ascending to power has happened through democracy. So, but we have focused more on the social cultural part. You bring today the political economy center stage, and that's very welcome thing for us, you know, except for a few speakers like Professor Pranav Bardhan or Professor Prabhat Patnaik, you know, they too also brought some political economy aspect. Today, um, um, uh, we are again um, <clears throat> discussing the political economy part. Um, you know, the curiosity I have is the following, that the democratic process as it unfolds in our kind of society uh, has obviously in front of our eyes has to some extent helped these uh, Hindutva forces to, to, to gain ascendancy and come to power and now have such, uh, such hegemony. But the other aspect is that they have been helped greatly by what I would call the capital, so-called the captains of industry. Not all of them probably, and that is what I'm going to ask you. Um, some of them definitely who are the major beneficiaries of this kind of regime, they of course must be helping and the whole of India knows about that. But, you know, if, uh, for example, social arena and the political arena can be handled by better forces, by progressive forces, by liberals, by more, uh, I mean, genuine Democrats, you know, and there is hope. For example, Rahul Gandhi has turned the politics around in the course of last one year, you know, in front of our eyes. Suppose such forces succeed in the democratic arena, in the political arena, and come to power. Can they manage the so-called captains of industry? Can they manage the capital? Because this for last 40 years or so, since the inauguration of Reagan Thatcher era, uh, welfare uh, economics has gone out of fashion. Most of the world, you know, there is what is called neoliberalism. You know, I mean, it is market fundamentalism. It is neoliberalism is not the appropriate term, but anyway, that is how it goes, you know landing all the way up to crony capitalism, the way it has happened in our country. So I do not know, you would know uh, uh, the answer, why welfare capitalism, why welfare state has failed to make a comeback in any major economy after 1980s or so? What are the economic roadblocks? And if in our country, for example, Rahul kind of forces win the kind of welfare and more enlightened political economy they are proposing. Do you think they can manage the captains of industry or given the state of globalization, uh, global capital will put so much pressure, pressure that uh, despite their good intentions, they cannot uh, bring welfare state uh, to India in any appreciable measure. Or if they do, then capital um, will just you know run away from India. So what what is your take? What will be the relationship of a welfare oriented enlightened government in Delhi? Their relationship with capital capital as it exists in India today. What will be your take on it, um, sir? Um, what you said has many layers, of course. Um, uh, but, let me, sorry. Uh, but let me start uh, by looking at what are the changes that have taken place in the Indian polity. Uh, Manishankarji, I would like uh, you to reflect on this. In our, in, in front of our own eyes, you know, the, the political landscape have, has shifted so much. I'll give you an example. You know, not even uh, 15 years or less than 15 years ago, every political party in this country used to say that they were secular. 
including the BJP. BJP used to say that, you know, we are secular, but, you know, genuinely secular, not pseudo-secular like the Congress and the communists, you know, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are genuinely secular. Today, every political party with very few uh, honorable exceptions and every political leader says that they are also Hindu, but not like them. Earlier, the, the narrative was that we are also secular, but not like them, not like the communists and the Congress. But today, the other side is that everybody is saying that we are also Hindu, but not like them. So in front of our eyes, the, 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 the central point of our political narrative has changed from being secular to being Hindu. Now there are there are leaders and there are political parties who say that we are, we are, I am also Hindu. I also keep a fast. I also get go to um, um, temples. You know, I also do puja part and all that kind of a thing. So this has happened. And why did this happen? It happened under our noses, under our watch, because there is a, an army of people, very highly motivated, dedicated capable of putting in hard work, continuous work, without expecting any quick results, without expecting any recognition. You know, we, we, we have to give credit to, 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 uh, to people who have put in that kind of work without expecting, uh, you know, uh, positions or publicity or, uh, you know, um, uh, immediate benefits, etc., etc. They, they put in and slowly and slowly the narrative has changed across the country. Now, if communal agenda has an, an army like that, on the one hand, on the other hand, if the constitutional and secular plural values have no army, how do we withstand the onslaught? I think this is something that we need to ponder over. And, you know, uh, I'll, I'll come to the economic aspect uh, that Ravi has raised uh, in a while. But before that, you know, whenever I see the political landscape and what is happening today, uh, especially with regard to communalism, with regard to, you know, the Hindu-Muslim, the hate and, and all that that we see today, the lynchings and the, and, and the, and the dog whistles that we see today, including uh, the Prime Minister's what he's saying in the, the, in the elect election uh, campaign, etc., you know, I am reminded of uh, the 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 short novel uh, uh, Albert Camus wrote, uh, the plague. You know, after the plague ends and when everybody is celebrating, uh, Doctor Revu say he doesn't celebrate, and when asked, he says, "Look, the, the plague doesn't the, the virus doesn't die. It just lies low." It may be in the wash basin, it may be in the cupboard, it, it could be in the car, under the cord, you know, under the chair and in, in a drawer, you know, here, there, and a bookshelf. And its strength is that it can wait. It can wait for a year, it can wait for two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 75 years, even 100 years. But once the immunity is low down, then it, 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 it comes up, rears its heads, raise its head virulently and attacks again. Therefore, you know, uh, unless you have a continuous vigil against this kind of a virus and also have a, a, an army in the civil society which goes on working on the... Because, we, have, we you see, political parties in India have become just election-fighting machines which are dormant between one election and the other. The in between, there's no activity, no political education, and, you know, they are happy in uh, in, in legislatures, it may be in uh, some kind of a small uh, position in the government, etc., etc., and there's absolutely nothing happening on the on the civil society. And civil society is, is, is just nowhere to be seen. And, and the... 
And you see, you 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 can imagine this. You know, when I when I saw the prime minister, in, I think it was in 2015 when he inaugurated the National uh, Science Congress in Tirupati. He gave uh, uh, inaugural address, and in which he said, you know, um, if you look at Ganesh, you know, he has a human body and an animal uh, elephant head. There must there must have been some uh, plastic surgeon then. You know, all the assembled scientists have clapped. What happened? Imagine a scenario where, when he said that, the entire hall was just quiet. Nobody clapped. You know, there was a stony silence in the hall. He would have felt ashamed. But when such eminent scientists, hundreds of them, clapped, he he was he you know he he was authenticated. He he thought I mean, this, this is what it is, isn't it? It's it's it's, it's not maybe it's not his fault. Today is is claiming much more. That's a different thing. So that is the kind of uh, uh, shift that is taking place. I said, Ravi, one more thing. You see, you you talk, you're talking about the uh, the captains of industry and all that. You see, people who are supporting this kind of a narrative, I categorize them in 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 in, in you know in, in in different ways. You know, in this country, there you see the the question is this: the question, the primary question in Indian polity, I, to me, it's been there, it is here now, and it's going to be there, maybe forever. Is this? Who does this nation belong to? There are people who say that this country belongs to Hindus. There are people who say that this country belongs to everybody. These are the two streams. Now, today, because you know a particular narrative for whatever reason, willy nilly they are they are in the, on the ascendant. All these people line up, you know, the captains of industry, the celebrities, and all of them lined up uh, in Ayodhya everywhere. And I do, and in the newsrooms and televisions, you know, uh, newspapers, most of them are. Not, and I don't think they are really communal people. But you know, it, it's some sort of a, a Faustian bargain. They they've sold their souls, and you know, for some reason, for some position of some kind of a benefit or some kind of a uh, you know advantage or some promotions and what. Whatever advantage they 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 are they're towing the line, but again, if if tomorrow the government changes, all of them will start uh, talking about secular thing, isn't it? So this is one, and there are people, you know, as I said, the, the, there are there are people. It could be ten percent, fifteen percent, twenty percent. We do not know, but there are people have been there. They are there. They'll be there. That you you who think that this country belongs to only Hindus and others have no place. If they want to stay here, they can stay here, but they have to reconcile themselves to a second class citizenship. That's also there. And uh, there, there are people who are very transactional in this. You know, there's an advantage and, and you know, they uh, they tow this line. Tomorrow there's an advantage on the other side. They'll, they'll become secular. Uh, they'll say Jawaharlal Nehru is a great man and Gandhiji is a great man and all that kind of a thing. Today, you know, God is a great man and Savakar is a great man. So the, the this 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 tussle goes on, and therefore the captains of industry today, when um, when they when they talk in favor of the government, they, they I don't think they really mean it. You know, they 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 they're just playing safe, or you know, they want to uh, curry favor of the government and all that. That is one. The the other thing is that you know, you know, when India fought for independence. It was an outlier. It was not as a part of a trend, worldwide trend. In fact, after India pioneered and got independence, the other countries also, that was a trend. So please do not think that, you know, uh, the, the entire world, you know, welfareism is discredited and your liberalism is on the ascendance and, you know, we also fall into that category and it is the right wing which is on the rise today. So today, India also uh, might be a prey to that kind of a trend. Please don't think so. Think, think, think like that. I think India, if at all, if it, if at all, there is a trend like that worldwide, I think India is going to stand up and push back the entire thing. I think India is capable of that. And Indian people today are looking for some kind of a sucker. And the the agenda that is coming up, you know, the, 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 the agenda, I don't think some people have sat, uh, sat there and wrote the agenda. I think the agenda has come about, come after 
a lot of churning which is happening in the in, on the ground you know I mean, there's a lot of interaction people are talking about it you know civil society groups are talking about it some you know they, there's a lot of this kind of a talk which is in the air and i think that is to a large extent captured by uh, the a lot of manifestos which are now challenging the the, the bjp narrative and i have a hope that if is it for for uh, the the west and the western capital if if you want me to put it that way what is india for them india is for them india is not 140 crore people india for them is 35 crore people or 33 crore people who are middle class who have spending power who can buy their suvs who can buy their white goods who can buy their uh, um, you know uh, uh, cloud uh, space and who, who can buy all those things. The, the 140, 110, 120 crore people, the rest of them, they don't matter. But once there is a regime change and there is some kind of a, a redistribution of power, then when 110, 120 crore people are empowered, the world would start looking at it. India cannot be ignored. And much more it cannot be ignored when this when not just 30 crore people, but 110 crore people are empowered. There is a question uh, in the chat box by Dr. Badrinath. How would you explain the unusual rise of stock market in this fortnight? Industry people would not support an outgoing regime. Mr. Badrinath wants to know. But uh, uh, the rise and fall of stock market is not a very sound uh, indicator of what the industry thinks. And uh, 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 to credit them with uh, 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 knowledge or foreknowledge of who is going in and who is going out is also, I think, is an exaggeration. So I, I do not think we should be taken by these things at all. We have with us uh, Professor Swadesh Mahajan. I would request him to uh, share his views and comments. Professor Swadesh Mahajan, please. Unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's audible. So, first of all, it was an unmitigated pressure to hear, uh, um, uh, I should say, Dr. Prabhakar. And um, it was, um, um, he touched um, many codes in my own thinking and heart. And um, I cannot imagine a greater overlap of uh, thinking uh, from anyone that I have encountered in the recent past. So that doesn't mean that I'm at the same level of uh, understanding of the Indian political economy as he is. It's just that uh, it was wonderful to have his analysis. So instead of talking about very general things, which other people might do, um, I will talk uh, and ask you some questions about um, um, the what, should, what can we broadly say the future of science in the society right now. You gave a very profound example that when in the session of the Indian National Congress, the Prime science, Minister Science Congress, science Indian Congress. National Science, Indian Science Congress, right? Um, which of course was haloed by the presence of people like Jawaharlal Nehru at one point, and um, so he made the comment about um, you know ancient India having plastic surgery. And you said that, of course, uh, the, the present scientists clapped. And you also surmised that um, if they had just kept still and looked sullen, you know, what would have been the effect on that? So my, as a scientist, my reaction was, why the hell didn't they walk out en masse? Okay. When such a preposterous thing is staged in the, in the home, uh, which is supposed to guard all of Indian science, and you just take it lying down, all right? So so that was, um, uh, I, I remember I was so profoundly upset with that, right? 
And I raised it at several points also, you know, with the many of my colleagues, scientific colleagues, and none of them, at least at my face, wanted to agree with the, the prime minister's uh, choice of such an idiotic example, right? But the fact of the matter is they all felt utterly helpless. They, and, and, and it's not whether they should or not, they do feel helpless. And what has happened then is that buoyed by that um, performance of the Indian scientists, Indian science is now being totally massacred. It's massacred to such an extent that um, uh, it's even difficult to imagine that from 10 years from now, there will be any capable Indian scientist, you know, even those who had been capable before, whether they will be able to maintain their uh, world-class stature because they're all being cowed down. Those who are good at research and not willing to cooperate, this, I, this I'm stating from personal knowledge of many scientists, right? Uh, so the Department of uh, Audits is being put after them. They bought some equipment 10 years ago. They had they done all the appropriate things to take care of it. So in fact, even those who want to do research, it's at standstill, okay? And every head of the institution, his basic qualification is that he's a RSS acolyte, not really how distinguished a scientist or an administrator that person is. So it seems to me that, um, of course, when democracy is at, um, at stake, nothing else matters to some degree, in my opinion. That's the first thing to say, right? But we need several armies, as you suggested, the, to, to fight against the very insidious armies which um, uh, RSS and BJP have launched into the country. And, um, and th this is actually not a new experience. The Republican Party for the last 40 years, again, had a whole lot of selfless workers who had no political ambitions of their own, but their only thing was they'll be writing letters and spreading propaganda to everyone at their own expense, all right? And of course, the results were that uh, you can lie with immunity in the United States politics and there is nobody who can question it. So the, so the point in India is that we have, I don't know that we have learned it from them because Indians never learn from others, we always know. All right. So maybe that uh, we discovered this particular thing that if you told a lie several times, OK, then truth becomes a casualty. And it really has become in almost every India. India is progressing. India is in a great shape. Look at uh, uh, how vibrant it is. You know, I ran into a professor in UT who was telling me that how great Modi is, right? So, so, so the question is that um, the people with some kind of a vested interest, as you said, that India is a market of 35 crore people, you know, and especially the NRIs also participate in that particular thing. And that, of course, strengthens the hand of uh, many people in the country. So my, I, I, I'm expressing my full support for, uh, for organized structures and groups which will try to spread the cult of science, I shouldn't say the cult, the message of science, and people who will deliberately be fighting against all the obscurantist and lies which BJP and RSS are spreading. And I think that this should be taken very seriously by all the major political parties, perhaps Congress, uh, and uh, uh, and of course, uh, civil society's responsibilities there are great. But uh, I, since I don't live there, I don't have uh, any clear understanding of uh, you know what structures can they condense around. So I think that I fully um, um, understand and support the desire that uh, kind of a relentless campaign to install the values that we all think are good and lovely must be done and uh, must be done immediately, independent of the results of the election. You know, I hope they are, uh, they are useful. And thank you very much for pointing some of these things out. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, 
there is a query in the chat box by Mr. M. K. He wants to know, sir, given our experience with majoritarianism, do you think we must move away from first past the post system to proportionate representation? We mostly anyway have lamppost elections. Mr. N.K. wants to know. Huh. You know, I have uh, recently written a, a long piece for the outlook on um, that we should have a, a, a very comprehensive debate about the way uh, we have uh, organized our polity, especially the elections. Now, you see, uh, where I argue that uh, India so far did not have a majority government at all. All the governments that were formed were the largest single minority governments in terms of vote percentage. I'm not talking about the seats. The, the largest mandate of Rajiv Gandhi was also on the basis of 48% of the vote. Now, the first pass post first pass the post system and the territorial constituency together are very, very inimical to the spirit of democracy. I do not know. You know, it, it worked. Uh, I, I think they, they, we, are, we are now uh, more than 75 years uh, of our uh, independence and we are a nation of 75 years. It is time that we uh, look at and see, look, you know, take stock of what happened and what was the what were the good things that it has delivered and what were the things that it could not deliver, why it could not deliver. If it did well, why did it did, did why did it do well? And if it didn't do well, why it didn't do well? And what are the things that uh, we can learn from uh, you know the past which are good? And what are the things that we eliminate? I think I think we need to take up a long long exercise. But I mean that 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 is. That is for some other day because today we are staring at a very huge danger to our republic and to the core values of our republic, of not only just republic but the nation. Um, you know, uh, we have reached a stage where in, in New India, people and organizations and platforms which had no role at all in the long drawn struggle for independence for the country are now able to market themselves as patriots as nationalists. So that is the kind of narrative that we are living under. But, you know, uh, that is a very valid point but that should be debated. I'll give you a very small example. The, the, why does, uh, you know, why does with 31% uh, and 37% uh, a political party, uh, a majoritarian, uh, uh, with a majoritarian narrative become so dominant? Is because of the territorial constituency and first past the post system. I'll give you a, a very hypothetical, it's a thought, can, thought experiment kind of a thing. I'll give you an example. For instance, let's look at uh, a, a political unit which has about 100 seats. And in, in 100 seats, I, I, uh, uh, I, I belong to a political party and Ravi belongs to another political party. And Ravi's political party polls 100 votes, but those 100 votes are spread evenly among all the 100 seats. But I poll 50 votes, but in 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 ten in five constituencies or 10 constituencies. Then I win 10 constituencies and Ravi doesn't win even a single constituency. So even, even if I poll 50% of Ravi's party's votes, my party occupies 10 seats in the legislature. This is one. The, the, the second thing is, you know, the, the first past the post system in, 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 in 100 constituencies, um, um, a lot of current candidates are there. And I my party wins by one vote in all the constituencies. Which means that my, my nearest, the difference between my, my party and my nearest rival is only 100 votes. But I fill all the 100 seats and others fill no seats at all. In a diverse country like India, with you know uh, so many languages, so many regions, so many castes, so many uh, religions, you know, uh, so much of diversity. If this goes on, you know, the the majoritarian narrative with the, you know that is the reason why the particular the, the the present regime is able to completely disregard. The presence of a, of a of a huge minority 
uh, in India, um, completely ignoring them, and you know uh, they, they don't find uh, a place under the sun in India, Indian polity today. So that is possible because of the territoriality and the first past the post, first past the post system. So I think I'm I'm not very sure if proportional or something else or something else or you know runoff and you know it should be fifty one percent. I don't know what they are, but certainly the existing arrangement has to be very very seriously re-examined. This much I can tell. And I may not have the solution, but the solution will have to emerge from a, a, a thorough-going discussion and a wide-ranging of discussion. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, sir. There is a, a question from Chatbox uh, which I would like to relate to you. It is uh, by Subrat Sarangi. He is asking, assuming that there will be a regime change on June 4th, and assuming that the new regime will last five years and that it would implement the Congress manifesto in letter and spirit, how do you foresee, number one, the large business houses would react to redistribution of resources, creating crores of lakhapatis, for example? Would there be a pushback from them? Or it would not matter because the economy of 110 crore people and the rest are more or less disjoined. Number two, how long it may take for the economy to make a turnaround? It's very important. Um, you see, there will be definitely some kind of resistance, especially especially those uh, uh, business houses which concentrate on the on the the, the 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 thirty crore economy, the thirty crore population economy. I'm talking about, but you know the the. The big corporations, the MNCs, which are into the uh, FMCG, which have a long, big, uh, large market in the rural areas, they will be happy because the rural demand will grow. So I think there is, there is not going to be a monolithic kind of a reaction or a pushback from the uh, 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 the captains of industry or the industrial houses. I, I don't think so. There will be, of course, there is a bit of a displacement and, and uh, they will have to adjust and uh, um, uh, there will be some kind of a rearrangement shortly. That's one. The second thing is, uh, you know, uh, just because there is a, a change of government, we should not lower our guard, both as far as the economy is concerned. Because you see, um, do not do not think that the Congress is uh, um, uh, the Congress or the other political parties are uh, not 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 the so-called neoliberals. There are very very staunch neoliberal voices and. Uh, uh, um, champions within the India Alliance also. And, and that is the one which has brought us to this stage of state of affairs. Please don't forget it. Um, I, I mean, we, we have to be even-handed here. Uh, let, let's not uh, uh, assume that, you know, once uh, the government changes, India Alliance comes and everything is rosy and we can uh, go back to our uh, normal lives. No. Uh, the, 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 the tendencies of, uh, uh, for instance, kind of draconian laws that we have today, like the UAPA, have, are illegal. They're, they're not an invention. They're, they're, they're not legislated by the present regime. They've been there. And, and when they wanted to, when the present regime wanted to uh, make it a little more dr draconian, in fact, they had cooperation from across the aisle. Please don't forget that. So there are, therefore, that is the reason why I say that the civil society will have to be very vigilant. They will have to exercise a, a, a lot of uh, uh, control, caution, and they keep. They have to keep on uh, speaking out, and you know, uh, uh, they, they they should work to create a demand for a humane society, a society which is wedded to redistribution, social justice, and, uh, you know, do away with the, the draconian parts of, uh, aspects of many laws. This, this has to go on. This has to go, this, this has to continue. And if, 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 if uh, that kind of uh, uh, initiatives are not taken, then 2029 is going to be 
a real much, much, much larger danger. Much larger danger. So we have to be extremely careful with this. Uh, we have with us uh, our friend Vinod Mumbai. Uh, Vinod, please unmute yourself and share your views. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Subhash and Ravi. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Prabhakar for a really excellent lecture for one who was <clears throat> born at a time and grew up when uh, Nehru was and Maulana Azad and these people were in power and set in motion an India that now seems to have long disappeared. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, a lot of the points have been touched, and I think uh, uh, the answers Dr. Prabhakar has given are really a very incisive and, and very worth uh, contemplating. Uh, my question is that you have pointed out this uh, kind of a two India scenario in the economy that there is one sector which is 30 or 35 crores, which is would be around 300, 350 million people, which would then make us, that would be like the fifth largest nation in the world, according to the population. So if we are becoming the fifth largest economy, as boasted by the prime minister, the current prime minister, then it's not a surprise that this uh, in numbers, this would also be the fifth largest. At the same time, uh, there is a lot of news uh, when you started by pointing out the dire unemployment scenario in which people are going even to war zones and so forth to look for employment. Uh, and there is also news that hundreds of thousands of people from India. I live in the US and uh, we see news that a lot of people being captured and detained at the Mexico uh, US border are in fact Indians now. A lot of people have come from India in very, uh, you know, uh, ways that are uh, <clears throat> uh, very dire ways coming through all kinds of problems. So my qu question is that this 35 uh, crore economy that is creating two Indias, if a significant part of even IIT graduates and so on are going to leave the country, where is the market going to appear in the future to sustain such a two India neoliberal or whatever you call it in the future. Thank you very much. Yes, that's a, that's a very valid point. In fact, you know, um, the people who look at 35 crore or 33 crore uh, uh, in his, which is equivalent to the population of the United States, somewhere around that, 30, 330 million or so. And think that, you know, you can do business with it and ignore the rest of India are very short-sighted because, you know, this, this, this uh, um, OSS cannot survive in, in the midst of, you know, that kind of a sea of misery. So it will engulf them, especially, especially in a society like India where the inequalities of, uh, you know, uh, gender inequality, caste inequality, religious inequality, regional inequalities, all these inequalities tend to get much more sharpened and accentuated by the economic inequality. Therefore, India would become a very unstable polity, unstable society, maybe even at war within itself. So you, you cannot be complacent about, you know, that part of India is shining, it will go on shining and let, let us ignore these people, give them five kilos of ration. No, it, 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 won't, it won't last long. But you see, the, 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 the Western uh, 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 economic players, 
why will they have a long term view of uh, india why would they bother they they will be all they they would be okay happy doing business with india as long as the the going is good and if, if, if when the going gets tougher they they will shift to some other place or you know for instance now uh, you know uh, they 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 thought of shifting from china they wanted to come to india but they could not come to india because of various reasons it could be labor law it could be human resources or lack of skills and all that most of them are going to vietnam or wherever from if vietnam is not working out they'll go somewhere else so what is their stake in india's india's economy they have no stakes in india's economy uh, their only stake is you know they they do business as long as you 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 give them some kind of a margin it is for us to uh, uh, you know uh, to to restore the kind of uh, balance from the kind of imbalance that we have it is that it is we who have, who have to do that that's a very valid point i mean it's it's a very very short sighted approach that people are taking um, if, if 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 the prime minister also think see what is the point in saying that we are the largest uh, fifth largest economy uh when you in terms of per capita income you are 140th what is the point in being fifth and what is the point in uh, being fifth largest economy and fastest growing economy if at all even those figures are very contested but if at all you take them at face value what is the point if if uh, uh, in world hunger index you are so low and when when a large number of your uh, the so called demographic dividend the young population of your country is uh, you know unemployed who are not productive and not only sir not only most of our young people are unemployed a lot of them are unemployable because there is a lot of skill gap people are not skilled you know all these uh, programs which were with very tacky uh, names like skill india make in india um, you know stand up india khelo india etc etc are just mere slogans nothing has happened on the ground you know they they went on saying all this uh, make in india skill india um, stand up india khelo india now now the, the the actual practical thing is shut up india you you are not able to speak people are not able to speak. even in parliament people are not able to speak that is the kind of situation that we are in today thank you dr bhakar we have among us uh, mr ramurthy who teaches uh, in the department of education delhi university he has a query i am going to delay it from the chat box um uh, he is bringing out a paradox that even though people are suffering from the most those who are suffering the most are ready to support this regime how does the psychology of brainwashing this kind of brainwashing to be countered second probably you will agree that prior to 2014 the debate on secularism versus hinduism was restricted to the political circle and upper strata of the civil society this regime has spread so much hate among the common masses how can it be over How can it? Oh, How can it? Oh, no, the last part is not clear. How can it? Uh, he is saying that previously the debate about secularism and uh, the communalism, the debate was only restricted to political circles and the upper strata of the civil society. But this regime has spread lot of hate among the common masses. How can we overcome that? Yeah. You see, that, I mean that that's exactly what I what I said uh, 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 a while ago. that you see when when communal agenda has a, a very strong dedicated disciplined army putting ready to put in long hours of work and hard work for decades and decades when when the other values the the constitutional values the republican values the democratic values the plural values the secular values have nothing we have to have an army that's there there is no alternative and because and and because political parties are not playing that role at all um as i said you know political parties have become uh, just mere ele election fighting machines uh, sleep walking from one election to the other in between the elections they are not doing anything in terms of uh, 
you know, educating, political education, secular values, so scientific temper, and all that, that is completely disappeared, and uh, they, they, they are they are not at all uh, uh, devoting their time and uh, their organizational resources to these uh, points of the agenda. That is the thing. It so so um, I do not have much uh, expectation from the political parties. I have a lot of expectation from the civil society organizations. They will have to work and they can work because you know once you're in a in the, in the in the in the political domain, you will have to uh, you know give and take, compromise, and you know all sorts of things, and therefore um, a, a lot of things have have, have been compromised by uh, parties which stood for uh, these secular values very steadfastly in the past. We don't have to go into the details, but we have we, most of us know what what uh, I'm talking about. Um, so the the and you see. Um, Somehow, uh, the 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 frenzy is so much, you know. You you hear voices like you know I'm prepared to pay even four thousand rupees per, for my gas cylinder, but you know uh, the, the 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 communal agenda agenda is good. You know, isne un logon ko sabak That that is also there. But that as I said, that has always been there. That is there today, and it will always be there. Some part of it, but. We need to build a larger majority of people who are wedded to the secular values. And, you know, we we ignored this agenda for decades, three, four, five decades. And suddenly we, people like us are worried about, uh, you know, what's going to happen on June 4th. That's not the way it functions. You see, this agenda to become ascendant and dominant in Indian polity, they took about 70 years. And it's okay. There's nothing. So that, that hard work is only the, the, the answer to this. Yes. Margot, would love to uh, please. Uh, please. I will. Uh, Mr. Uh, Abdul Mukdir once has mentioned that Dr. There is query from. Uh, Mr. Abdul Mukdir, Dr. Prabhakar mentioned Margaret Thatcher era of UK or say Reagan era of USA. They coined the term trickle down economy. So maybe the people will gain. So that is that is little query, um, Abdul Mukdir. Yeah, this is this is a very uh, very famous uh, uh, theory. In fact, you know, recently uh, there, there, I've written somewhere. I mean, that's that's in one of my. Uh, Pieces recently, I, that, that's where I mentioned Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and all the neoliberal uh, uh, Friedman and Hayek and all that. Uh, I didn't want to go into the technical details, but you see, it simply is, means this, you know. Uh, and Professor Panagaria, who is now recently appointed as the uh, chairman of the Finance Commission, who was earlier uh, vice chairman of the Niti Aayog, the founding vice chairman, the, 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 the vice chairman when, when the Niti Aayog was established. He wrote a piece uh, immediately after the report of the World Inequality Lab, where the Inequality Lab has come out with a uh, with a finding that in India, uh, never in its history, even not even during the British time, that inequality is so high. And now India's inequality is as high as it is in you know uh, uh, Brazil or South Africa or United States, even more probably. Um, simply, the findings are as follows. One is that 1% 1 of India's population corners 22% of its national income. Two, 1% of India's population owns about 40% of its wealth. And three, this is the, uh, uh, the data set is from 1923 to 2023, 100 years. This is the high point. Last 10 years, 12 years is the high point. This, this, these are the findings. And, and within days, 
within days of the publication of that report, Professor Padagaria, who, who has said, you know, recently appointed as the uh, chairman of the Finance Commission, he wrote a piece in the Times of India. Interestingly, it is titled as Do Not Lose Sleep Over Inequality. In other words, inequality is good because, you know, there are wealth creators and wealth creators... When, when they create wealth, you and I also get, you know, as uh, 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 the, the um, uh, uh, I, I forget the name, uh, as he mentioned in the, in the question, you know, the trickle down, you know, you just wait, they, they, it will trickle down to you, if not today, tomorrow, if not tomorrow, after a year, if not uh, after a year, uh, maybe after two years or five years or whatever, you just, just wait. This is the theory. But you see, that's not, his, that is not what is happening today. You, you, the government is showing 7.2% growth, which is contested, even if it is not 7.2, it will be 6.5 or 5.5, whatever. But you also have a largest uh, ever youth unemployment in this country. Larger than even a small neighbor of ours, which is Bangladesh. Bangladesh's uh, youth unemployment rate is about 12%. Ours is 24%. So, which means that the trickle down is not happening. And Poverty is rising, inequality is rising, uh, rural distress is rising, uh, household savings is falling, household uh, liability is rising, and a lot of uh, people are leaving the country because they, and you know, um, earlier uh, uh, somebody who went, when he intervened, he said uh, uh, there are a lot of people coming into the US illegally from India. Yes. You know, today, unlike before, today the largest illegal immigrants into the United States who are caught, we don't know how many people uh, without getting caught are entering, that's a different thing. People who are caught are, last year, there are 93,000 Indians who were caught by the U.S. immigration. And of them, I'll give you another uh, interesting uh, fact here. Of them, of the 93,000, 23,000 are from vibrant Gujarat. So that is the kind of, which means that the, the, the trickle down in Indian economy, I don't know what happened uh, uh, as a trickle down in the, the West and the US and UK or the European economies, but in Indian economy, so far, the empirical evidence does not uh, uh, support the view that trickle down happens, you can wait. There is a question uh, by one Mr. Uh, Said Sahi. Let me read it. Uh, he, say, he is asking, what is your reading about the Muslim community in India? Has it given up on the political process? If so, what do we do to bring them in without being accused of vote banking cattle? <laughs> you know, uh... It's very difficult to answer that question, but I feel uh, the the Muslim community is very acutely aware of what is happening. And uh, my my reading, I may be wrong or I may be right. I don't I do not know, but my reading is that they do not want to you know openly come out and challenge the regime because that would probably result in a backlash and a consolidation of the. Hindu fundamentalism or Hindu uh, right. So I th I think there is a, a very quiet undercurrent where the Muslim community is aware, very acutely aware of the danger to the Republic, to their existence. And, uh, you know, another thing is, uh, in this election, many people in the ruling party have been saying that they will change the constitution. Give us 400 because we want 400 to change the constitution. It has come out very prominently in the media. So that has, I have a feeling, I mean, this is the, these are the reports that I get from different parts of the country, that it has somehow woken up the Muslim and Dalit and OBC to the danger of that, you know, these people are out to do away with the reservations. And, you know, the NRC and CAA kind of uh, initiatives that they, they uh, undertook earlier, 
the, the, that has threatened one section and reservation narrative has threatened the other section. There is some kind of a consolidation, but a very quiet consolidation so that it doesn't result in a backlash and counter consolidation of the Hindu right. That's my observation. There is a, another question uh, by Mr. Pulakesi. Uh, one is Dr. Agaram Rajan in his recent book says that there has been a significant improvement in infrastructure development recently. How do you look? How do you see that? And second one, Rahul Gandhi in one of his recent interviews also felt that the neoliberal policies initiated in the 90s have produced good results, but the economy has to be affected again. How do you see it? And the what should be the, to, the economy has to? Ha, economy has to be restructured so that those results can be um, accessible to all. That is the meaning. So how do you see it? And how do you, how do you see this proposal for the re, new restructuring of the economy? Uh, you know, um, see, when we liberalized uh, our economy in 1991, we did it because of the circumstantial compulsions that time. It was not a, a well thought out choice. It was almost like a firefighting. And if you remember, I mean, those uh, uh, phrases have gone out of currency now. Those days in 91, 92, 93, 90, up to 94, 95, the you know uh, reform with the human face and safety net they they those, those uh, phrases used to be very very popular those days so we you know, we had to undertake that and under that under those circumstances there were compelling circumstances we did but you know we we were very cautious but after that you know we went whole hog that is the reason why I keep I keep saying don't uh, you know uh, uh, think that you know there are no neoliberals in the in the India Alliance. D these are the pointers. You know uh, we we have to do that and it's, it's done well. You know I, I'm not saying it is it's not done well, but then uh, it, it, it did, did it require that we really give up every other uh, element of welfareism in our uh, economy because this is a different kind of a country. This is a country, um, unequal uh, inequalities in this country are not just economic inequalities, but, you know, social inequalities, religious inequalities, regional inequalities. Your language can be a barrier to you, uh, give you inequality. Gender can be, caste can be, your place of residence can be, so many inequalities. So, these inequalities are sharpened and ex accentuated by the uh, economic inequalities. So if if the if the redistribution if if the if the, if, if the economy is skewed, for instance, Rajan says about uh, infrastructure, but infrastructure where uh, infrastructure is good, all right. But then how are we doing it in a in a in a labor ab abundant economy? How do you do that? If you emulate uh, uh, labor saving technology which is more suitable to the United States. In fact, most of the labor saving technologies have evolved in the United States, but because that is a labor scarce economy. If you blindly follow that model and bring those things, and you know, if you if you if you do not redirect the technology in order to serve your economy and your economy's needs and its strengths and its weaknesses and you do not tailor that, then you will have a problem. So, which means that you, you invest a huge amount of money, lakhs of crores of rupees in infrastructure where it doesn't generate jobs. When, see, I, I, this is very important. When, when the government claims and when, of course, Rajan also says that, you know, uh, infrastructure is really booming and it's done well, Modi regime has done uh, very well in, in, in infrastructure. What has it yielded to address the question of poverty and the question of unemployment? If these two are not addressed, 
And if you think that if you develop uh, uh, infrastructure today and after, uh, you know, 10 years, 15 years, uh, it will slowly um, uh, yield results in these sectors, then it will be too late. One. And secondly, when, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very fast evolving uh, uh, technology scene today. Um, it's not like the 60s, you know, between 60s and 70s, you won't find very discernible change. From 70s and 80s also, you don't find very discernible change, very little change. Eight, between 80s and 90s also, after 90s, every decade, it's a phenomenal change, unrecognizable. Now, in that kind of a dynamic flux, where 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 technology AI now now there is a there is a AI bandwagon now AI if you bring in into India so many jobs are going to be displaced and we are a labor abundant economy I'm not saying that you know you 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 have to be um, um, you have to be like Luddites and you know anti technology I'm not saying that but then you need to have some kind of an understanding and a redirection of technology in order to suit our economy's needs and understand our own economy. It's good that in infrastructure is happening and a lot of investment is going into the infrastructure. But then wh what has it done to address the poverty, inequality and unemployment situation? If you don't address this, then you are falling into the uh, trap of neoliberalism in a different way. That is why I I am very very cautious about India Alliance because India Alliance also is in the is some of the elements of the India Alliance also are in the thrall of neo streaks of strains of neoliberal economic thought, which is not very suitable for a labor abundant economy like India and a very stratified society like India. Uh, one more question, probably that will be the last question of this session is from uh, Dr. Virinci. Uh, he's asking, you have mentioned about having an army of uh, uh, mind, uh, army of people with secular and democratic values working relentlessly uh, in society. How to make this a possibility? As you said, political parties cannot do this, but how can civil society do this? Do you have any ideas or steps? Um, <laughs> well, I know I what I want. I want this. But how to do it? And, and let's put our heads together. I, mean, I, I don't have everything. Just because, uh, um, you know, Bhargava made me sit here and uh, speak doesn't mean that I have everything. Uh, you know, I know everything. Um, but, you see, it, it can't be it can't be a, a monolithic national kind of a thing. In, at every level, at every level, um, I think there, there, have, there have to be small, small organizations. They, some people could, uh, some societies, some organizations could work on scientific temper. Some could work on uh, secular values. Some could, you know, uh, fight against obscurantism. Some, some people can propagate the uh, values of diversity. Some people can propagate, uh, you know, uh, tolerance. You know, all, all those kind of things. Maybe some, some people are Gandhian. Some people are, you know. Uh, Marxists, some people are something else. But, you know, all these are whatever differences they have. But then when it comes to, you know, defending the liberal, diverse, uh, plural, democratic, secular values of uh, our public, they have to close the ranks. This much I know. How do we do that? Well, we have to put our heads together and, and, and do it. And, and there is no alternative to doing it. We have to do it. You know, uh, uh, Bhargav, uh, you see, when the Prime Minister gave a call during the COVID lockdown, that we all come out and, you know, uh, light a lamp or, you know, uh, uh, bang the plates, we did it. There is absolutely, you know, uh, nobody said, what the hell is going on? Which means that, you know, scientific temper is completely worn off. Like a like a paint gone. So that needs to be built. 
So these are the defenses. These are the guardrails for our republic. And you know, you have uh, once the guardrails are gone, the defenses are gone. It has gone to such an extent that you know, I do not know if you are aware of this, but Allahabad High Court bench has asked referred a case to the Allahabad University head of the astrology department to tell them whether a woman, because it was a divorce uh, 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 petition or something like that, if 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 the if the lady is a, is a manglik or not, by and and directed directed the directed the lady to give her birth chart to the astrology department so that they will look at the they look at the chart and determine whether she was already married or not because the man who lived with her refused to marry her because he got to know that she's a she's a already married woman. And she went to the court saying that, look, uh, he lived with me, he exploited me, now he's refusing to marry. And, and, the, and the man said, she's a, she's a married woman, that's the reason why I'm not marrying. And she said, no, I'm not. And therefore, the judge wanted this to be referred to the astrology department of Allahabad High Court. So it has gone into that level now. So we need to fight that. And, you know, in order to fight this, if we expect this to be fought and you know before June 4th, it's not possible. It has to be fought continuously, it has to be fought relentlessly with a long-term agenda because the enemy of these values have done it on a long-term basis relentlessly for the past 70 years or even more. Thank you very much, Dr. Prabhakar, for this uh, wonderful session. Savita Singh, do you have a question for high school? I could not follow. Rashmi ji? I would like to ask Savita Singh, do you have a question for high school? Please, please, please. Uh, great to listen to Dr. Prabhakar. He has mentioned the emergence of new situation of gender inequalities in the country today, I would like him to elaborate this aspect of his lecture. Oh, um, you see, if there is if there is inequality uh, and rural distress, the worst sufferers are again. Uh, everybody is a worst sufferer, but more worse than the worst is going to be the women in the household, in the village, in the in the family. That's going to be more, you know. Um, when uh, see, the government now gives you five kilos of uh, uh, free food grains uh, uh, to a family a month. And if those five kilos, do you think they are going to be equally distributed in the family? No. I think in some way or the other, voluntarily or involuntarily, the, the, the women are, uh, you know, discriminated a bit more. A girl child is dis discriminated more. And uh, a male child and a male member of the family is is favored. So at at, at every level, the uh, you know if there is inequality, if everybody is suffering, a Dalit suffers more, an Adivasi suffers more, a minority suffers more. If a minority suffers more, the women in the minority suffers even more. Uh, a women in uh, the Dalit community suffers even more. Uh, women in uh, Adivasi communities suffer even more. It, it's like that. Uh, I request uh, Mr. Manu Chakravarti to uh, read his question. Uh, in this long chat box, sometimes questions are overlooked. I'm sorry, please, you raise your question. Uh, Prabhakar ji, namaste. Uh, my question is just this. The, the assertions, emphatic assertions of the two supreme lords of the BJP, that they have already crossed 400 seats, that they're going to get an absolute majority. Now, do you think there is something very sinister, very malevolent about their plans and schemes? Should it backfire? I would. I, I suspect something sinister and malevolent behind such assertions. How would you respond to that, Prabhakarji? Hi, Manu. Manu, thank you very much for asking this question and uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, Professor Manu Chakravarti, whom I respect a, a lot, Bhargava. Uh, Manu, uh, 
you know i at the at, at the end of the third phase when uh, the polling was completed for uh, 370 the home minister had said that they are already won 270 out of 370 you know that's one now they are saying that anyway they are crossing 400 and they've been saying this for a long time. In fact, the Prime Minister had said this on the floor of Parliament, on the floor of the Lok Sabha, that they would get 370 on their own and their alliance would get 400 seats. And have you have you seen this Prime Minister speak like a caretaker Prime Minister? Because once the elections are declared, everybody becomes caretaker. They, 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 they're not actually the Prime Minister. They're only caretaker Prime Minister, caretaker Home Minister, caretaker any minister. But they don't behave like that. In fact, they are using every public platform, every government platform. To <laughs> the prime minister went to the Reserve Bank of India and said, "Look, I'm coming back, and you have you. I'll uh, just take rest for uh, you know during the campaign. And once I come back, I, I'll give you uh, an assignment to give me a, a, a next hundred days. What I should do? You have to work on the uh, uh, on on those plans. So he's talking as though he's is anyway. It's a foregone conclusion." Which means that, you know, either they are very, very confident about the mood of the people, which apparently is, 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 is very doubtful, or they are very, very confident about the other things, you know, the, the, their capabilities in manipulation, it could be election commission, it could be machines, it could be polling. Because we see, you know, uh, the, the, there is a huge inflation of uh, almost about 6% uh, on average, but, you know, in some places it is 10%, some, in, some state, in some states it's even 15% of uh, uh, inflation of votes, uh, number of percentage of votes, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, uh, so election commission's conduct, you know, the not uh, um, revealing the actual gross figures for almost 15 days after the first phase and taking their own sweet time and defending the tooth and nail uh, that they their uh, their reluctance to you know part with finally they are parting with they parted with it yesterday and we do not know whether they are inflated or not. Then again. Uh, is, is the machines that people have really cast their vote, are, are, those, are those the machines which are going to be open? There's several questions and several doubts about this. The only reason why there are so many doubts, Manu, is because the, the, the way they constituted the present election commission by eliminating the role of the Supreme Court lends itself, the entire process lends itself to a lot of suspicion. And probably that is the reason why they are they're, they're so confident. If that is the case, I think uh, you know political parties to some extent and largely the civil society will have to stand up and resist this kind of a thing. There is no other way. And you know, we cannot afford, India cannot afford another term by the present regime. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. So uh, I invite uh, uh, Professor Swadesh Mahajan ji to uh, share his comments. Yes, uh, th thank you. I just wanted to talk about this. Um, um, this uh, civil society's uh, sanctioned science army in order to really bring about uh, understanding of science amongst the people, not necessarily technical science, but the spirit of science. And that's a very big job. And uh, I have been, uh, you know, fighting that for a little while in my own limited way. Whenever I give a lecture in any Indian university, I demand that in, in addition to a technical talk, I would also like to give a talk on, uh, on uh, what I call science, not science how to distinguish the things around you which are scientific and which really uh, could not be called scientific. And my experience was that even amongst the educated who are uh, very well uh, tuned towards wanting uh, to have a scientific temper and scientific understanding, they also do not quite appreciate what exactly scientific, being scientific means. 
And one of the things which comes out, and I'm sharing it with you folks in general, is that people don't seem to appreciate that even if the truth value of a statement may be one, that it's true, it does not need to be scientific. And uh, so, so one cannot then um, understand whether our ancient sages were able to create uh, um, uh, structures which were scientific or they just made statements which might happen to be true. And I'll give you an example. And um, I hope I'm not too long. So you will read in um, Upanishads and Vedas and almost everywhere, and doesn't matter where you go, you'll find the universe is full of energy. This is a statement which is made very commonly in uh, almost uh, all societies. So then when in the um, 1960s, uh, the astronomers found that really speaking, the universe is filled with what can be called energy, which is uh, electromagnetic radiation at three degree K, then everybody believes that, you know, our ancients understood it and they, 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 what they did was scientific. The point is it's not scientific. In order to really make it scientific, you have to tell me what kind of energy is it? How do I measure it? And if I do not find, uh, is it uniformly distributed? And if I don't really find all these things, then would I still um, be able to hold this theory? And so the question is that just because you have seen somebody being cured of something, unless you give me the entire process of causality and its repeatability, you do not make a science. And so I think that even amongst our own peers and friends and the people that we normally understand, spreading exactly how to really appreciate and realize and smell uh, a scientific mode of thinking as appeared to uh, some speculation is extremely important. And I believe that one of the things is all of you who are trained in uh, uh, science and other things could really begin to do in your own local surroundings. I'm an 80 year old man, so I'm just used to giving advice to various people. So don't uh, take it remiss. But I believe that unless you act in your local neighborhoods, and then have a perpetuation, the idea of being able to scientifically analyze uh, or even understand uh, uh, statements which are thrown in front of you, we will not be able to make them very public. Thank you. Uh, would you like to respond? No. Uh, the, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, which means no. No, in, in science is more of a method than an assertion. And you know something which doesn't admit questioning is, is no science. And falsifiability. Yes. Uh, Satira Chaudhary ji has raised his hand. Satira ji, please unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I, I believe uh, everybody uh, agree, uh, understands the power of media. And uh, I, I wonder if uh, uh, Dr. Prabhakar has and others have given thoughts to how to democratize the media. Uh, I would love to hear some views on that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. As you said, uh, um, you see, most of these people who are ranting uh, all the uh, uh, things that the government uh, wants them to rant about, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of them, a significant uh, number of them are not really, uh, uh, you know, signed up to that kind of a narrative. But, you know, th these are all people who are opportunistic kind of uh, 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 who jumped onto the bandwagon because that is the winning bandwagon. And 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 don't be surprised. You know, many of these people will uh, the ownership and the proprietorships and you know the uh, many people who are now uh, uh, you see them uh, doing this kind of a narrative. They they might overnight they might uh, uh, turn uh, very secular once this dispensation goes. That is one. 
the the second thing is we have to live with some kind of you know i do not know if you are aware uh, we used to have uh, in my childhood something like mother india by babu bhai patel very very stridently right wing and stridently hindutva oriented those days you know that they, they were all there they, they will be there some some people will all, always be there but that becoming the dominant thing has become has become dominant after some kind of a patronage and encouragement by the the existing uh, regime that is one the second thing is to a large extent the digital and social media has democratized democratized the uh, media space of course it it has its own uh, uh, downside and all that kind of a thing algorithms and you know heat uh, uh, gets amplified and all those things but you know they are, they are still uh, one can negotiate and renegotiate those uh, those spaces um but you know uh, the 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 media landscape is fast changing and it is getting digitized more and more and a lot of people are able to you know uh, amplify their views and broadcast their views without subjecting their views and uh, opinions to the gatekeepers of the traditional media earlier you know uh, now now you don't have to pass through an editor of a news channel or a newspaper you, you can uh, uh, write a blog yourself and share it uh, very widely so democratization technology is also bringing in the only thing is that lot of people like us we have to participate in it populate that space thank you uh thank you very much dr prabhakar for this uh, wonderful presentation and also very enthusiastic engagement with all the participants with all their diverse questions and we really enjoyed this session and thank you everybody for participating in this uh, meeting and hopefully we will meet next month with uh, in another lecture in the democracy dialogue series and those uh, who want to visit uh, view the old lectures in youtube you can just drop your mail id in the chat box so that we can share our youtube link to this uh, lecture series thank you very much thank you